Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching this Thursday night, June 22nd, in-depth ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. First of all, tonight's video is going to be a little bit different, uh, so if you want to get right into the forecast, just uh, fast forward seven or eight minutes and you'll get into it. But what I want to do at the beginning here is I want to answer three questions that have been asked repeatedly over the last week or so. And the map you've been looking at while I've been talking, of course, was the Tonga eruption from two Januarys ago. And there's a lot of questions about this eruption and its influence on our uh, weather patterns. And I thought we just might take a moment to talk about it because when this eruption happened, it was so tall and straight up that uh, it boiled off the top of the ocean here and basically increased the stratospheric water vapor load by about 10%. Now, when this happened, we had a discussion about how it did not put a lot of sulfur dioxide into the upper atmosphere, which tends to be the biggest effect that volcanic eruptions can have because that tends to give you a, a couple of maybe 18 months to two years of cool cooling following big volcanic eruptions, but this one did something different. It put a lot of water vapor uh, into the um, into the stratosphere. Now, when we think about water vapor, remember, it's a, it's a pretty powerful greenhouse gas. So if you put a bunch of it in the stratosphere, what you're doing is you're, you're enhancing the, the warming effect that's in the stratosphere. And what that does is that tends to make it more statically stable. It tends to make it um, basically um, a, a stronger inversion at that layer. And we just wonder what that's doing to the tropospheric weather patterns. And I'm going to tell you something I don't think anybody knows, and I certainly don't know, but I want to make a case for something for us here today. This is a reminder where Tonga is. So if I just kind of zoom in here, uh, you'll see it. So Tonga is right in through there. Okay, so here's Australia. And as I kind of zoom back out, we're, of course, south of the equator. So this, this volcanic eruption was right in this particular area. And the next thing I want to show you comes from NASA. There's two great scientists studying uh, st stratospheric data, and they look at ozone, they look at all sorts of stuff, but they do make a water vapor, um, uh, what we call a Hovmuller diagram. So time is on the x-axis, so going back to 2004 and then finishing now. And then you have uh, north latitudes and south latitudes. And so we're just looking at a slice through time running north and south, averaged uh, across the planet. Now what I want you to notice is this. This is the location right here uh, of Tonga when it erupted, again, January of 2022. So that's that, that one right there. And what has since happened over that time period is this increase in stratospheric water vapor load. We're up here at 10 millibars or 10 hectopascals. You can actually see that it is now spread into both hemispheres. And that's a characteristic that in the upper atmosphere is easy to do. In the lower atmosphere, it's very difficult to mix Stop something from one hemisphere to the next, but in the upper atmosphere, it can. So this means we've seen there's basically a lot of excess water vapor in the upper levels of the atmosphere. I just want to make one point about this. I don't think that it is playing a primary or kind of a, a first importance role in controlling the weather patterns right now. It is something that happened, and, but to understand its contribution, it might be playing a, not even just a secondary role, but like a tertiary uh, role in, in the overall pattern. So I don't, want, I don't want anything to be attributed to this because over the last 18 months, we didn't attribute any major weather factor to this. So I, I don't think we, we have it now. But again, this color shading here is the increase uh, in the water vapor load. That was the first thing I wanted to address. The second thing has to do with this, and I love this picture. It was taken several years ago. You are in Florida, and what you're seeing here is the flow coming off of the ocean, and the buildings are forcing the air to rise. Now, we know that this air coming off the ocean must have been very close to saturation. In other words, a relative humidity of nearly 100%. Because the moment it was lifted up over the buildings, lifting air allows it to expand. Expanding leads to cooling. And just a slight bit of cooling caused condensation. Now, you can see as the air flow over the top, it eventually evaporates as it comes back down because descending air compressionally warms. So that's why we get clouds in ascending air and we have clear skies in descending air. That's why I always talk about convergence, divergence, getting air to rise and sink. It's all about, honestly, in our atmosphere, mass conservation. That, that's really it. But anyway, I'm getting way ahead of myself here. What is um, helping the water vapor condense is salt. There's a lot of salt in the air. And the crystalline structure of salt, when it's lifted off of the splashing waves and gets into lower atmosphere, serves as an amazing, uh, uh, what we call condensation nuclei. Now listen real carefully here. If our atmosphere had no impurities, no dust, no salt, no aerosols, nothing, nothing that our noses have to filter out or the mucus in our mouths filters out or anything, just nothing, no impurities in the atmosphere, you'd never have a cloud. It's impossible. And that's because in order to get two water vapor molecules, 
floating around in the air to stick together to create a liquid drop that has just two molecules in it, um, you need relative humidities approximately 500%. And that doesn't exist in the free atmosphere. And the reason is that the, they have so much energy that when that bond is made between two water vapor molecules, it is not capable of keeping the bond. It's too weak. Therefore, they break right back apart. You'd have to supersaturate the atmosphere five times over in order for that to occur, which means we need impurities in the atmosphere to make this happen. Now, we generally think of marine air over here as being much more clean, I guess you'd say, than continental air. And what that means is there's fewer CC and cloud condensation nuclei over marine air than there is over the continent. Now, why is this all important? Well, I've been getting questions asked of me about if the smoke from the wildfires is impacting precipitation. And I would like to provide you with, with one piece of an answer to that, okay? And it comes back to some of my notes I used to give my students when I was teaching at the University of Illinois. This was coming from a 200 level uh, lecture uh, on atmospheric sciences, and we were discussing something called the warm rain process. This is the very basics of it. Now, what I'm telling you is the water vapor molecules in the atmosphere will not condense unless they have something to condense upon, and this is what salt looks like. So the water vapor molecules condense, there's enough condensation to get them to grow. Because the CCN helps with the size that is needed to get it to grow, you have to have a large thing to grow on. You can make rain droplets in as few as 30 minutes. And then they basically rise in the updraft and they fall out when they're large. They collect on their way out and we call this condensation, uh, this condensation and then this process following, which is a collection, and then, and then it falls out, all right? Now, that process is only made possible by stuff in the atmosphere. I want to make that very clear. And if you want to go through all the details about the differences between uh, homogeneous and heterogeneous nucleation, I'd love to teach you about it. It's a lot of fun. But the main thing you need to know is if there are no impurities, you've got to have a rel rel relative humidity, excuse me, almost 500% to get this all to happen. And you can read a little bit here as to why. But in our atmosphere, we have what's called heterogeneous nucleation, which means we have these CCN or cloud condensation nuclei, which are micron-sized hygroscopic materials. And here's a list of some of them. And this is what I want you to get, okay? If you have a given amount of water vapor in the atmosphere, and that water vapor is sitting over the ocean, it's very easy to grow raindrops quickly and get them to be large because the water vapor because of all the cleaner air that's over the oceans, the water vapor all gets attracted to a fewer number of CCN. So your distribution, in other words, the number of droplets per cubic centimeter, gives you bigger radius of those droplets. So there's more bigger ones. Now listen, if you have a whole lot of CCN in the atmosphere, in other words, the atmosphere, we'll just call it dirty just to make this make sense. There's a lot of stuff in the atmosphere. There is less competition to find a CCN onto which to condense. And as a result, there's a lot of very tiny droplets. And the smaller they are, the more difficult it is for them to um, go through the, the coalescence process and fall out, the, the collection process as well. Now, why am I telling you all of this? I'm telling you this because when we inject more CCN, be it, as you see up here, soot, dust, ash, sulfates, aerosols, smoke into the atmosphere, you are creating more places onto which the water vapor that's available to condense. Now, let me make this maybe thought of in another way. I like to think of it this way. I hope this works. Um, imagine you're at a high school dance, right? And it's, it's kind of odd. A bunch of the guys don't show up. If only two or three of the guys show up and, and the girls want to dance with that guy, th those two guys have all those girls to choose from. So they may all just come in and Condense right there, right? I don't know if this is appropriate, but whatever. Then imagine you had the opposite. Let's imagine that you brought, you know, the, the nearby all boys school over and they outnumbered the number of girls by like 10 to 1. So each girl, which in this case represents a water vapor molecule, has her choice. That's the difference between clean and dirty air. That's why you can get precipitation quickly out of marine air. And sometimes you can have clouds full of water that never make precipitation. Okay, I'm telling you that because we've been watching these wildfires and there are still wildfires today here in parts of uh, Quebec and a little bit in Ontario as well. And this is putting CCN into the atmosphere. And the question is, is this CCN, this smoke, is it actually providing more services onto which you can get water vapor to condense 
and as a result, not producing rainfall, that is a possibility. That's one possibility. But the reality of it is, is that the air that this is flowing into, like into the Midwest, there's not much water vapor there in the first place because it's been so dry. So we can really look at all these things and start to stitch them together and try to make a story out of this. All right, here's my last one. I've got a lot of questions lately about the flow of the air coming out of the east in the Midwest. And you can even see some of the smoke here today from these wildfires coming out of the northeast. And the question's always been, well, normally when I get northeast flow or east flow, it t I, I remember I've been told that that makes thunderstorms or that makes rain. And that's true in certain situations, but not in others. And let me explain to you the ones where it's not the case. I'll give you two examples. We're going to rewind the clock back here um, to the early part of June. This is June the 4th when we had a very large area of high pressure here, and there's just a general larger area of high pressure around it. Now remember, when you're thinking about a high, a high pressure cell, the air flows clockwise around it. So around this general area of high pressure, we had flow like this. And if the high pressure cells to your north, you get easterly flow. And that's what we've been seeing. So there's been a lot of easterly flow in the Midwest that's not associated with rainfall. In fact, it's what's been bringing the smoke in here. In fact, it was also the smoke that came into New York City back in early June as well from that flow. Now, low pressure centers, they spin counterclockwise like this. And that's why when one approaches you in like spring or, or, or winter or even in fall, it typically an easterly wind means it's gathering into a low and therefore capable of making a lot of, um, you know, a, a lot of rain. Not the case when it's south of a high pressure cell. So let me show you what we're looking at, you know, here coming up. This is the flow today. And I was getting comments today in Illinois. We have northeast flow and no rain. Well, that's because in this situation, there's a low to the south. So all the rain here is out ahead of it, where it taps into the moisture from the Atlantic and the Gulf. So all the heavy, heavy rain is here. On the northern side, there is some. But the farther you get away from the low, you still get the northeasterly winds and, and, and nothing. So I just wanted to take a moment and, and share that with you. I hope the examples made sense. Um, each one of those examples, we could have an entire you know college level course and spend 75 minutes really digging into it. But I get asked questions and I'd like to answer them. So, so there we go. The real part of this comes down to this map. And we've just been keeping an eye on this now since May the 10th. It's the newest update for the precipitation ranks by climate district over that time. And we've got the same story. Massive storms continue to erupt here. They run down the line here where that stalled out boundary is. And we've had anomalously easterly flow and high pressure and extremely dry weather in this area. And it is not lost to me to remember that this is a huge area. And even though I've got a little backyard itis because I live right here in a very, very dry climate district, we need to just understand that this is hitting major areas that grow a lot of big crops, corn, soybeans, and others. And it's not to say that the farther west you go, the better it is. I mean, this quadrant right in through here in Nebraska is still hurting. And while we do expect better rains in the northern plains with time, Overall, this pattern needs to change significantly in order to stop the expansion that we've seen on the drought monitor. And this was released this morning. And once again, we've seen a lot of one class degradation throughout much of the Midwest and Great Lakes states. And that's really the biggest change with all of this. Now, I want to keep this theme going here and try to give you a bigger explanation as we kind of step forward on all of this. So how about more on anomalous winds? Now, I've made a case for the last five weeks that it's been the displacement of the Bermuda High, which is here, and its lack of its position normally, which is there, that has been making all of these other factors line up to make it very dry in this area and give us the anomalously easterly flow. That's what that is. That's what you're seeing in these wind vectors. But why did it get that way in the first place? Well, for a long time, this was the culprit. When you look at ocean currents right here, there's a cold ocean current that normally comes up and upwells right here. And there's a warm ocean current that goes over here. It's called the Gulf Stream. So there's a cold one coming in this direction. It is called the, I think it's called the Canary Current. I'll have to go back and look that up. And this one is the Gulf Stream. Now, if you push an anomalous wind right here, because remember, remember what we learned earlier, the trade winds typically glow like this toward the equator. Well, if you have an anomalous wind that is out of the west toward the east in the tropics, you're going to stop the upwelling of the canary current. And that is part of the reason why the ocean temperatures began to get so warm here. We didn't have the normal upwelling. And they're colder here because we've reduced the extent of the warm flow like this. So these two currents have been weakened and they're backwards. Now, why is the high pressure sitting here? Well, that's where all the heat is. 
and it's going to that area and sitting and building over where that heat is. So this, that just wanted to give you an explanation as to why we see what we see here. We still have our negative phase of the Pacific Meridional Mode. We know that the Bureau of Meteorology has now projected that this will be 3.2 degrees Celsius. I can't really write well here, I'm sorry. But 3.2 degrees Celsius by November. That's how strong they're projecting uh, this El Nino to be. But as it stands, these two features continue to dominate the pattern. So what happens is the jet stream comes in and it never completes the journey across the country. And that's been what's really holding us back. So let me give you this now with some data. I made a map this morning that goes out until yesterday, the 21st, and it looks at all the precipitation we've had in the month of June, but I've subtracted away anything less than a half inch. So I want you to kind of see through to the white holes in this as to the places that have been really, really dry. We can also see the places that have been extremely wet. And a lot of this in through this area where we have some places that have easily eclipsed 10 inches of rainfall. In some of these areas in through here, we've had a tremendous amount of hail as well. So this map goes from the 1st of June to the 21st and just shows you all of the locations that have measured um, hail according to the, the data set I've got. That's a lot. That's a lot of hail in those areas. And we talked about that in this morning's video. Now today, as the sun was setting here on our first full day of summer, look at what we see. Smoke here, an upper level low sitting and spinning over parts of uh, the Appalachian Mountains. Big storms kind of circling around it. And then another day, of large supercells developing here throughout the high and western plains just delivering um, you know hail tornadic activity and um, just more severe weather and it's not done we're gonna have more of this tomorrow one important thing to note here got a new image there the smoke that is here in texas is from wildfires in mexico and that large ridge in mexico is a critical part of the overall shift in this pattern that we have to continue to discuss going forward so what about the recent precipitation? Let's get an update on this. There we go. That's through 8 p.m. on uh, Thursday night. That upper level low has really just dumped a tremendous amount of rain in the last three days out of, coming out of Alabama into Georgia, North and South Carolina, up to Virginia. Right along, along the Appalachian Mountains, some places picking up six or inches or more. And then all throughout here, this is all severe thunderstorms, many of which have produced more hail, tornadoes, and up here, the first meaningful rains in some of this area and parts of the Dakotas in a while, and more is coming. And this is why. This guy right here is the one we're watching. So here's the big ridge that's sitting over Texas and Mexico. That's what's pumping in all of this heat into the southwest and into the south. We then see the downstream trough that's still sitting here. This is the load that's curling up over Ohio now. But it is this trough that's going to come over the top, and this weekend possibly increase rainfall chances on some of the driest areas. Now, when I say possibly, I want to quantify that. I'll show you the, the probabilities in a few moments, but I also want to say one system coming over here will not undo the long-standing drought in this area. We need two of these every 10 days to make this whole thing better. But this will be curling up as a low right here as we work our way into this weekend. And now you start to see that it is pulling the moisture in. So an easterly wind in this case is actually bringing in the rain. This will be the frontal boundary they're going to watch as we get into the day on Saturday for ripping off some severe weather in parts of Iowa. And then as we go forward, we're going to watch this over here in parts of Indiana as well. So now let's get into it. Here is uh, Friday. Uh, this is what the severe weather outlook looks like. So again, all along the western and high plains, the risk of, of large storms producing tornadoes, straight line winds, and, and very large hail as well. As we then go into the day on the 24th, this will be the Saturday, we're going to watch western Iowa. Again, the Storm Prediction Center has been honed on, in on this for three day, or two days already. And so we're going to continue to see that in this area. And then as we get into the day on the 25th, we're going to watch this get over into parts of Indiana, southeastern Illinois, down into this part of Kentucky. That's where the risk area is going to be. In the middle, because you noticed on Saturday here and then on Sunday there, this area in the middle will have thunderstorms. They will go through Illinois. They're not going to be the best coverage, but they're going to come through here. And the problem is, is the timing of them that we have to be concerned about. Okay. So tomorrow morning's video, be sure to watch that because we'll be able to see even farther out with our high-res models. But let's pick this up at 8 o'clock tonight. Storms pop in here, storms there. Here's our upper level low. Let's go forward into this uh, tomorrow morning. This will be Friday morning, Friday afternoon. 
And watch again. See the storms popping here. See out ahead of this low, all of the moisture that's moving into parts of the Red River Valley out of South Dakota into Minnesota. We see still what's left over of the upper level low spinning here. And then as we go into Saturday early morning, this is what we're going to watch. There may be two rounds of severe weather that come into parts of Nebraska, South Dakota, this corner of Minnesota and Iowa. The first one could be late on Friday night, followed by what could be an MCS that goes all the way down here, maybe even toward Kansas City. Look at that. The model's really just picking up on that feature there. And then you go into the day on Saturday, and there's going to be another round later in the day coming through Iowa. These are just absolutely critical rains hitting this part of Iowa. Now, as I take it out there to Sunday, it will be the outflow of these storms coming through Illinois that are going to be key. But look at the time. To get the outflow coming through Illinois at 1 a.m., this is now going to have a stable boundary layer. These storms are going to have to ride the top of the boundary layer. And as a result, they just tend to, in this particular scenario, not, not be able to do what they could have done if it was the afternoon or evening. And that's the concern for parts of Illinois. But there will be storm complexes rolling through. This has been pretty well realized in the models, but we need to know how much is going to be there. So from there, let's go have a look at this. The high-res NAM, add it all up. This is what we've got. So take a quick look. That's the results of the model run I just gave you. But I want to add to that the European model next. The European model in its 12Z run today, when you compare it to this morning's 0Z run, went wetter in all of this area that you see in green here. Now, there's a few areas outside of it that it went drier, but this was an important update in the European model, which has had a better handle on this pattern than the GFS. So to show you what's going on here, there's two things. Let's get you queued up here. Here's the, the wave we're watching. It goes right over the top of Wyoming into Montana. This is Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon and evening. Now watch right there. That's the, the system that's kicking off the flow. And that low goes over this part of uh, the Great Lakes. Now it's being followed by another one right here. And this one comes into the Pacific Northwest and rolls over the top. And possibly, I'm watching right here, next Thursday, dives across the same area. That has now given us two chances to try to get rainfall into this area, but we are going to look at the probabilities in a few moments because this is just an operational run. What are these going around? This big ridge that's going to be parked down here in Mexico, Texas, and parts of the southwest. So the operational European 12Z model run, total rainfall through Sunday is there. And then we're going to watch the second system. Look at how heavy this rain will be in this area. The second system comes through. And there it is next Thursday, Friday. Now, remember, operational runs, we know that they have been flip-flopping back and forth, run to run to run. So we're just looking for any evidence in the pattern that could give us a shot of rain through this area. In fact, we should just make that a little bit bigger, this whole region. High confidence here, lower confidence in this region. Okay. Now, from there, I want to show you the GFS. I've got the 18Z run of the GFS. Ironically, after weeks of being the wettest model there was, going out there all the way to next Friday, it's drier in this whole area. So the U.S. model has trended drier while the European model has trended wetter. But what we're going to do next is we're going to look at the probabilities. So this is the chance over the next 10 days of getting an inch of rain. The GFS first. This is the best I've seen it do for parts of Missouri, Iowa, Illinois, Wisconsin, Indiana, Michigan, and down here into western Kentucky and Tennessee. This is the best I've seen. It's over 50% in this area. We've known this region was going to be wetter here. We've known it's going to be wetter up the East Coast. The GFS has also improved storm chances throughout parts of the Canadian Prairie. Let's now go look at the European Ensemble. And let me take you back here to the 12Z run so we can compare apples to apples and probability of an inch. And let's take it out there to 10 days. There it is. Now, the European model has increased in this corridor, Wisconsin, Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, but it is not as high in here in parts of southeastern Iowa, most of Illinois, and Missouri. All right, that's where the change has really come in. Now, that is not to ignore other places around the country. I'm just focusing in on a region I know that has been exceptionally dry and needs this moisture. The northwest part of the Corn Belt here, upper Midwest, it's going to get it. I mean, there's a lot of rain coming in through here with these next few systems. From there, I want to show you where the pattern is going to be day 10. Everything all eyes will be focused on where this ridge is. And then it'll be focused on where that, you know, 588 line is. Uh, 
history would tell me watch this corridor for the biggest storms so i'll just kind of outline the corridor i'm thinking about here you're going to see the models though try to put rain a bit farther to the north so you can see this is the cpc they're wet and stormy here that's over the top you notice that the European model still has a drier quadrant in through here, but it's no longer as dry. All the models, by the way, are wet up the East Coast. You can see that here. But the GFS is, again, the most aggressive on bringing in the rainfall here. And if this verifies, this is huge to the crop in this area. But I'm just going to tell you, we need to wait to see how this weekend storm system performs to then get a gauge on the next system next Thursday and then see if this does fully play out. In the meantime, we're actually finally starting to see heat coming back into places that have been very cool. I'm talking about California, and it's going to continue to stay very hot down here in South. We better go talk about those temperatures. First, though, I did want to bring you up to speed on our two tropical systems. Brett is going into the Caribbean, and there's a lot of evidence that it will get into the Caribbean and probably just end there as a tropical depression, too much wind shear. And then behind Brett, we have tropical depression number four, which is right now expected to become a storm but not really survive this trip north. If we look at the ensemble spread, we get Brett going here, TD4, which would get the name Cindy going up like that toward Bermuda uh, around where the displaced high pressure cell is here. So now let's talk about temperatures because I've been talking uh, earlier about some of the frost events we've seen in the parts of the Northwest. So I went to Idaho Falls because uh, there was frost in and around Idaho Falls. And uh, just to let you know, it's not uncommon. It's just rare to have a it's pretty rare to have a frost this late, but it's not that it's never happened. Uh, I got a comment on YouTube this morning about Butte, Montana. It's actually more common there to have a frost. They can have their last frost all the way to July 6th when you look back over the last 40 years. But the temperatures are beginning to moderate in that area. So before I show you them, I want to give you this. This is our latest update on the growing degree day anomalies from April 1. The one place that's not going to have much change is going to be here but we're already packing in the heat into Texas, of course, and into the Southwest, and California's got some warmth coming toward it as well. So to go see that, let's first of all take a look at the GDDs we expect over the next seven days. So some places in Texas picking up well over 220 GDDs, all right? And that's because that is where the hottest conditions are. So watch this, five-day sliding window of average temperatures from the 12Z runs today. And notice by day 5 through 10, there is warmth coming into California. First time all year that we brought in some sustained warmth. The cooler air is going to take a while because the flow is going to come around this ridge and there's deeper troughs still sitting in this area. Okay, But as I play this out day 10 through 15, we start to see the pattern moderating as we approach and go past the 4th of July. And this is the first I've seen some heat coming into California. Now that is a change. And therefore, we need to see what this does to the position of this larger ridge. And if that begins to increase later, the storm chances in this area. As it stands, looking out there that far, the heat that's coming into that area from the 30th through the 6th right now has the Climate Prediction Center issuing an excessive heat, a uh, high risk of excessive heat down here in this part of Texas, and then a moderate and a slight up north of that. So there's a lot of heat that's coming into this area, which means these ridge riding storms that come over the top of this are going to be critical to watch to see if we can bring some relief to the crop areas and through here. But the last thing I want to get to is the newest European weeklies. Our problem, child, is the Bermuda High. And through the first week of July and into the second and third, the anomalously higher pressure is here. So this is not yet returned to where I want it to be if it needs to be aligned up along the East Coast. So let's go back here to the United States. Yes and then look at the precipitation anomalies. And I want to show you all the way out here through the month of July again, and just tell you that the model continues to be drier in this area. This has been very consistent and much wetter here. And again, the reasoning behind that is the ridging is south, the flow is convergent, the troughs are too deep in this area. So I really appreciate you giving me a lot of extra time in this report tonight. Um, hopefully you found the stuff at the beginning meaningful and useful and, 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 and answer some questions. But I'm going to stop it here, and I'll talk to you one more time this week tomorrow, and then uh, we'll talk again next week. Thanks.